This morning's reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 17 verses ch- chapter 11 verses 17 to 34. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe in part, for there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you must be recognized. When you come together, it is not for the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and we had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, It will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go before the Lord together. Father, we are thankful for your love for us and for the love that you've shown us in Christ Jesus and for his death on our behalf and the forgiveness that it provides us through the cleansing work of his blood. We ask now that as we come to your word together, your spirit would work in our hearts and allow us to see ourselves more rightly in light of who we are in Christ and who he's making us to be. Would you guide us now and help us to respond to this text rightly and truly? In Christ we pray, amen. You may be seated. Sharing in a meal together is one of the most symbolic and formative acts in human culture. When you eat a meal with someone, you're communicating with them and you're communing with them. It's an act that forges relationships. It testifies to our shared dependence, our need for sustenance, our affinities, and our camaraderie. And as Thomas Foster explains... Eating with one another is a way of saying, I'm with you, I like you, we form a community together. And so when the peace is broken during a meal, that offense is intensified because of the backdrop of that communion forming setting. So this is why there's always an edgy feeling when you're at a restaurant and the couple in the booth behind you starts to argue. Or when you're at a family gathering and siblings start to bicker over the dinner table. And even when you're watching a film and the scene cuts to the gangster in the back room of a nice restaurant and then he takes out his opponent. There's something just awful about that because the very symbol of the meal is violated. So when disharmony is pictured in a meal, it's heightened, and we have to feel it more intimately and closely because something very intimate is being violated. And this is precisely what's happening in the Corinthian church in the text that was just read for us in 1 Corinthians 11, 
verses 17 through 34. Paul, in this text, is going to respond to this disharmony, and he's going to try to bring peace about in this broken community. Now, it's my understanding that you're observing the Lord's Supper next Sunday. So I hope that this reflection and consideration of the text will prepare you for that great occasion. So turn with me, if you haven't, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as we consider the the situation at Corinth. Now, as we consider this text, we need to be careful not to read our own modern-day experiences and practice of the Lord's Supper backward into the situation at Corinth. We can read this text in a way that just puts our own experiences into it, and I think we're going to miss here what Paul is saying. So I'm going to take just a few moments to reconstruct the historical setting that Paul is addressing here. So there are a few items we need to consider. The first is the situation in which the Lord's Supper was observed, the location where this assembly was gathering, and then finally the social situation at Corinth. So first, as we consider the meal, the setting of the meal as we gain an, a backdrop for this text, we need to understand that the church at Corinth observed the Lord's Supper as part of a larger meal. So it wasn't a one short moment part of a worship service, but it was really the culmination of a church family meal together. Likely in this day, the church met in the evening because they didn't have a weekend like we do. And so there were the poor class who worked all day long on a Sunday, and then they'd gather with the assembly. And so it just really made sense for them to have a meal together before they worshipped. And really that meal was the beginning of their worship time. And this really probably happened on a weekly basis. So they're celebrating the Lord's table as part of a meal every week evening. So erase the picture in your mind of the Lord's Supper as an individual oyster cracker in a thimble, okay? There's a lot more going on here than that. It's in conjunction with a full meal. Erase also the picture of partaking the Lord's table in a nice designated room like this one. The church met not in a designated building, but in the home likely of a wealthy member of their assembly. And in that home, there was a dining room that could afford about eight to ten people. And then there was an outer larger room called an atrium for larger dinner parties. So if you're picturing a meal, think about the fact that some people are probably eating in the dining room and others are in an outer room in the atrium. Now these meals in Corinth society were more than just a a way to fill your stomach. Instead, they were met as social statements. And so there would be large gatherings of meals, and these wealthy individuals would invite a plethora of people to the meal across the social spectrum. And the point was to emphasize their status and to exalt in themselves. And so you might have experienced something similar to this if the CEO of your company or another higher up had a large meal at their estate and you're one of the peons of the company. Well, you're not there to add value. You're there, in a sense, because you're exalting in the glory of the CEO. And that's probably what was happening in a lot of these meals in Corinth. And that really goes to highlight the problem of the socioeconomic division in that city that was bleeding into the church, as we'll observe later. I mentioned that guests across the spectrum would be invited to these meals, but only the privileged elites would be sitting in the dining room. So according to their custom, they would recline while they ate. So the elites would be there reclining in comfort while the poor people were out standing or sitting in the atrium. There were a couple of customs that pertain to the meal that was provided. One custom included guests bringing their own meal. So you'd show up to one of these extravagant homes with the food that you're bringing, and unlike our American potlucks where you'd put your food on the table and everyone would go through a line and share equally, you would eat your own meal. So if you're a poor individual coming after a long day of work, you're going to eat a paltry meal 
while the hosts and the other elites are eating something really quite scrumptious and filling. The other custom included the host actually providing food for everyone, but the host would reserve the best food for the elites in the dining room, and the rest of the people would have kind of a paltry meal, a lower quality food. You've actually probably done something like this. So at your large family gatherings, all of the adults are in the dining room, and you're eating something really delicious, steak or something like that. And you set up a smaller table in the kitchen for the kids, and you serve them mac and cheese. So picture that, but picture the division not being based on age, but being based on socioeconomic status. Those on the lower rung of the ladder were in a lower room, given lower quality food, effectively shaming them and exalting the elites. I think that this is the exact situation that Paul is dealing with. But the problem is heightened because the Lord's Supper is being celebrated in conjunction with this meal. So keep this picture in mind as we turn our attention to the text, and I think it will help it make a lot more sense. As we turn our attention to 1 Corinthians 11 then, Paul is going to describe a, the problem at hand, and then he's going to move on to compare the Corinthian celebration of the table with Christ's institution of it, and then finally he's going to give steps toward a solution to this problem. But he begins here in verse 17 with a description of the problem, providing a rebuke specifically towards the elites in the assembly. He writes in verse 17, But in the following instructions I do not commend you, because when you come together is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So Paul highlights here the problem that's been imported into the church's celebration of a meal that was just normal in Corinth. So it appears that the elites were indeed separating themselves from the lower class during this mealtime and either providing such low quality and small amounts of food that the common person just was hungry and that the elites were full, or that people were bringing their own food and the elites weren't waiting for one another, and that the poor were still going hungry as they ate their own minuscule meals. So the problem here is essentially that the haves were feasting while the have-nots had nothing. So Paul makes a point to say that the wealthy or the elites here are full and that they're drunk. I think Paul is probably just using this hyperbolically to say that they were satiated. I think if there was drunkenness in conjunction with the Lord's Supper, he would have addressed it more clearly. But his point stands. Those who were wealthy were filled, while those who were poor were not, and they were in the room right next to them. There was just no regard for the body of Christ. The result then was that the wealthy were exalted, and that the poor were humiliated and shamed. So while the Corinthian society would have looked in on this meal, they would have considered the elite's behavior customary and perhaps even commendable as it would be right for the elite to be recognized and the poor to be shamed. But Paul will have none of this. This kind of division in the assembly is antithetical to their shared identity in Christ, Because in Christ, they were equal participants in grace, and they were equally in the new covenant community. Instead of using the value system of Corinth, these elites ought to have looked at others with the value system of Christ. 
They were stuck in the value system of Corinth, and they ignored this new covenant value system brought in by Christ. So that's the problem. Elites exalted, poor, shamed, unity in Christ is now divided. So Paul quickly moves then to compare the Corinthians' practice of the Lord's Supper with Christ's own institution of it. And he starts here by just recalling what Christ had done. So in verse 23, he writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So with this contrast, Paul is instructing the elites to radically alter their approach to the Lord's Supper. Instead of drawing attention to themselves, they were to draw attention to Christ. And instead of coming as a small group of elites, they were supposed to come alongside their fellow believers. And while we could gain from sustained reflection just on this paragraph, we have to grasp at least how the Corinthians ought to have approached the Lord's Supper together. First, they were to remember of Christ's death for them. So by remembering Christ for them, they were reminded that they were not self-sufficient. Regardless of what society or their bank accounts might be telling them, they needed Christ for them. And just as Christ was for them, they ought to have been for one another. Not salvifically, because being for one another does not save, but they were to be for one another sacrificially, sharing in all that they had received from Christ. So in this contrast, first, they were to remember clearly and distinctly Christ for them. But then second, they were to unite with the new covenant community. So instead of allowing their coming together to highlight their division and differences, they were to come together as equal participants in grace. And as they looked at the blood of Christ pictured in the cup, they were to remember that they were co-labors in the gospel and equally cleansed by the blood of Christ as they enter into this new covenant community. The very nature of a meal is that it's to be shared. And Christ makes clear that this meal, his meal, is to be shared by his people because they've been made one in him. But then third, they were to proclaim that Christ was for all. They were to proclaim Christ's death for them and for all who would receive him as they oriented themselves to Christ's return. And as they thought on Christ's return and picture the fullness of the kingdom, the kingdom that's already but not yet, when it is yet, all will be made right. All that's broken and distorted in this world will be fixed. And all who are in Christ will be revealed as they truly are, not as they are designated and assigned according to an earthly value system. So this meal was meant to draw them together and to allow them to share in Christ with one another. And the contrast highlighted the brokenness of the Corinthian community. They were not one, they were not sharing in Christ, and they were not together. Paul moves then very quickly to pick up his indictment of the elite's behavior. And then he'll follow with an instruction and a warning to remedy that behavior and to restore unity within the church. Now, this is just an initial response in chapter 11, but the full response, and I think really the antidote to these divisions, is in chapter 13. So this response and this solution to the problem is just a precursor to what is to come, and that, that final solution is love. So just as they were sharing in the love of Christ, they ought to love one another. 
but Paul gives them here some very initial steps to take as he once again indicts their behavior. He first, in verse 27, indicts their behavior as participating in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. So you read in verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. This is probably the most complicated verse in the whole section, and so it's worth chasing these two ideas First, the idea of receiving the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And then second, the idea of being guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So with reference to the idea of being guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, we need to just recognize that throughout this epistle, Paul has been addressing certain problems within the church. And a lot of these problems have caused division and they're wrapped up in people sinning against one another. And any time that Paul addresses one of these issues, he really concludes by saying that when you're sinning against one another, you're also sinning against Christ. So in chapter 6, when Paul addresses sexual immorality, he talks about the fact that you're bringing Christ into that sin and you're sinning against Christ there. In chapter 8, when he's talking about eating food offered to idols and the sin against the brother who would believe that you can worship multiple gods, Because of a believer eating food offered to idols, you're sinning against that brother. So wherever there's a sin against a brother or sister in Christ, there's sin against Christ himself. That's what's happening at the Lord's Supper. Just as they were despising and humiliating certain members of the assembly, they were despising and humiliating Christ himself. Even as they partook of a meal that pictured Christ in his body and his blood, Paul uses that imagery to say you're sinning against Christ. You're guilty of the body and blood pictured in the bread and the wine. As such, they can be described as guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So if you sin against one another, you sin against Christ. The other idea of receiving the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner is perhaps more practically and regularly misunderstood because it works its way out in the way that we practice the Lord's Supper. So what does it mean to partake in an unworthy manner? Well, if we look backwards and then in the immediate context and then forward, I think Paul lays out really clearly what he means by this phrase. So if you look back first to verse 21 and 22, Paul says that the Corinthians, in their eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another goes drunk. And then he describes them as despising the church of God and humiliating those who have nothing. So I think the exact meaning of the phrase as Paul's using it, the exact meaning of an unworthy manner, is to take of the Lord's Supper in a way that does not consider the brothers and sisters and, in fact, exalts the elites and shames the poor. So there's a bit of irony going on here, isn't there? The elites were saying, we are worthy. Those who are in this inner room and taking of the best food are worthy, and the rest are unworthy. Paul is correcting them and saying, you're participating in this meal in an unworthy manner because you're despising the church of God. But then when we look forward to verse 29, we see the principle at play here. Principally speaking, to take of the supper in an unworthy manner is to eat or drink without discerning the Lord's body. That's a phrase used in verse 29. And I think what's being talked about here is the metaphor of the body for the church. So the church is the body of Christ. This is how Paul uses that metaphor in chapter 10, verse 17. And I think what he's saying here is that if you do not discern the body, that is the church, as you come to the table, you'll be partaking in an unworthy manner. So to fail to discern the body of Christ is to fail to understand the nature of the church. 
That is, to fail to understand that we're equal participants in grace and members of the new covenant community. This becomes even more clear then when we look forward to verse 33. So an unworthy manner in that exact context is the elites exalting themselves and shaming the poor. In principle, partaking in an unworthy manner is not recognizing the church as shared participants in grace. And then looking forward, Paul talks about the right way to approach the Lord's table. He says in verse 33, So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another so that it will not be for judgment. So partaking in an unworthy manner results in judgment. Partaking in a worthy manner does not result in judgment. And in application to this church, to partake in a worthy manner was to wait for one another or to receive one another. Very practically for this assembly, that meant that everyone is filled, that the elites who don't have to work during the day aren't going to begin this worship meal together without the poor. It means that they're going to provide for one another, they're going to care for one another, and they're not going to make a statement in their society about who should be exalted and who should be shamed. Paul comments then along those lines in verse 34 that if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So if anyone wants to come to the table just to fill their own belly and to exalt in who they are, then it would be better if they didn't come at all because that would be coming in an unworthy manner. So to the Corinthian church, they ought to refrain from participation in the table if they were making the meal about them and not about Christ in the covenant community. To do so would be to invite God's judgment. So Paul is not providing a warning to avoid participating in the Lord's Supper simply because of one's self-awareness of his or her own sinfulness. In that sense, all of us are unworthy as we come to the table because we all come as sinners but we can come worthily in Christ. So to come without Christ and without regard for his people is to come unworthily. To come to the table as you look at others in your assembly and you look down your nose at them as less valuable or less worthy is to come in an unworthy manner. So grasping Paul's use of this phrase as shorthand for the elite's approach to the table, frames his instruction in verse 28, where he tells us, let a person examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. There is then to be a spirit of self-reflection when we approach the table. However, in this exact context, Paul's instructions are aimed at the elite's urging them to consider the nature of the church in their relationship to that assembly. Instead of going ahead with their own meals, they were to consider their responsibility to one another as fellow heirs of Christ, and then to actually change their practice after they reflected in coming to the table so that they would share together, so that none would go hungry, so that none would be humiliated, and so that Christ would be exalted. So it is indeed important to approach the table with a measure of self-reflection. But we must be careful not to practice the kind of self-reflection where we sit in our chair and close our eyes and not consider anyone around us, only looking in at our own soul and failing to remember that Christ has purchased us with his blood. Now, there are instances, I think, when an individual in the assembly should not participate in the Lord's table. Paul has insinuated this on a couple of occasions throughout the letter. And it's notable that whenever he does, it's with respect to unrepentant, ongoing sin. So you think of this in 1 Corinthians 5, where there's the man who's sleeping with his his stepmother. 
And Paul instructs that the church discipline this man and that he not be counted as a believer. There are other places as Paul continues to work through the letter, instructing them not even to eat with such a one. So it's notable that when one is not permitted to the table, generally speaking, it's for ongoing unrepentant sin. Now, unfortunately, I think some have misunderstood this text to mean that any individual just struggling with sin should just refrain from the Lord's Supper. However, the Lord's Supper is the primary way that Christ gave us to look on him and to tangibly abide in him. So we need to just recognize that we'll never find the solution to our sinful dispositions by reflecting on who we are and looking inward. In our self-reflection, we must be moved to recognize that we are sinful and that we need Christ. So we must look up to Christ and gaze on him. And very often, our gaze is focused on Christ not by refraining from the table, but by approaching the table in humility and repentance and faith. In this way, our participation in the table is a picture of the gospel work that Christ has done on our behalf. It's a metaphor for the gospel and our conversion. Because in coming to Christ for salvation, we did not fix ourselves or clean ourselves up and then abide in him. Instead, he welcomed us to himself, calling us to repent and run to him in faith. And that's what we ought to do every time we approach the Lord's Supper, is to recognize our sin, repent, and engage in the celebration of the table. As such, there are certainly times when we need to refrain from participating in the, in the Lord's Supper. And that's when we're unwilling to repent, when we're harboring sin in a spirit of unrepentance. But we need to remember and recognize that when we refrain from participating in the table, we're picturing the fact that we're cut off from the new covenant community. So participating in the Lord's Supper unites us to that community. Refraining cuts us off from that community. And so if you, next week, as you approach the Lord's Supper, feel that you cannot partake because of sin in your life, refrain. But let that refraining set in as the reality that your unrepentance cuts you off from Christ and his people. If you feel that you can't partake in the table because of that harbored sin, then don't, but consider those who are around you and consider your need to invite one of them or one of your pastors into your life to help you work through that sin so you can be restored to Christ and to his people. Ideally, then, the examination of oneself isn't just of oneself. It's a community act. It's a work done by the church, and then generally the church voices who's welcome to the table and who's not. Those under the discipline of the church are not, as they, Lord willing, will come to repentance. Those who are in fellowship with the community are, and they picture that fellowship as they partake of the one bread and of the one cup. Now, we need to recognize that when individuals are under discipline or when we're harboring unrepentant sin, we put ourselves in the aim of God's judgment. Sometimes through the discipline of the church, sometimes through God's own providential working in our lives, but we need to know that the way that Paul describes that judgment is really a merciful judgment because it's a judgment dispensed through discipline and not final condemnation. So turn your attention to verse 29, where Paul picks up this idea of God's judgment on those who harbor sin, who don't discern the body, and who partake in the table. He writes, For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks damnation or judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. 
that again is the corporate church judging truly. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So Paul accentuates his whole point throughout by connecting their approach to the table with the ailments and deaths that were occurring in their assembly. It's notable that these are a discipline from the Lord, but again, a discipline that is not a final condemnation. So regardless of the reality that the Corinthian church had adopted Corinth's value system, Christ would not adopt their judgment system. He would judge them in mercy, an act of discipline that would not lead to final condemnation, but to restoration with him through Jesus Christ. So when we consider a text like this that's so practical to, our, to the life of the church as we regularly approach the Lord's Supper, I think it's really appropriate for us to respond to this text and to meditate on how we ought to respond to it. So I'm going to provide two categories of response for you. There are certainly more. Think about them and work through that. But I think just very broadly, we need to respond when we're scattered in the community, so when we're not in this room together, but then there's a a response and application for when we are together, so when we're scattered and when we're gathered. And I'll give you two lines of thinking under each of them. But first, when the church is scattered, I think that you can work and I can work to invite others into our home. Invite others into your home for a meal, and share in your food and in your home and your family and your life together. And as you do this, as you invite others, consider inviting especially those who are in the assembly who are least like you. Allow the unity that you have in Christ to bridge beyond the affinities and interests that you have to welcome any from your assembly into your home. Now, if you're not accustomed to doing this, it might be a little awkward. You might not know what to talk about. You might not think that your food is fine enough or your personality entertaining enough. But when you're tempted to think this way, recognize that you're falling into the trap of thinking with the worldly value system. The worldly value system says you're worthy of having people in your home. If your house is clean enough, you have good enough food and you're funny. But Christ's value system says, welcome others into your home because you share in Christ together. And your value is not in the size of your house or the quality of your entertainment, but in the relationships you have with one another through him. So share in your life together as you invite others into your home in the spirit of 1 Corinthians 11 and Paul's rebuke to the Corinthian church. But then secondly, I would encourage you to review your church covenant on a regular basis. If you're like me, you probably rarely read your church covenant. At our church, we just recently began reciting it together after we partake of the Lord's table. But guess what? We forget during the week of our responsibility to one another described in that covenant. That covenant's a record of the commitments we've made to one another flowing out of the commitment that Christ has made to us. So I think that regular review of your church covenant will allow you to cultivate in your heart a love and commitment for one another. I think, too, that this is especially important when you're in a relational conflict with someone in the assembly or when you're just simply tempted to value other people according to the value system of this world especially as it relates to things like fitness and beauty and wealth and humor. When you're tempted to value people based on Minnetonka's value system or America's value system, read your church covenant and calibrate your value system to Christ. So when you're scattered, when you're away from here, invite others into your home and review the church covenant. 
when you're gathered here, when you're together as an assembly, make an effort to engage with others. Involve yourselves in the meals and activities of the church because it's in these settings that relationships are formed and deepened and cultivated. It's in these settings that you're put in a space where you have to be with people who don't look like you or enjoy all the things you like, and you get to enjoy the one thing that unites you no matter what, which is Christ in the gospel. So look at your church calendar, plan it into your schedule, and show up whenever you can. Of course, not everyone will make every event on a calendar, but when you do, don't just simply show up. Show up with an intention to relate rightly to others who will be there, to receive them and share with them in Christ together. Now, I think as a side note, it's certainly right and appropriate to form closer friendships and relationships with some than others. That's natural and it happens. And that's really actually a good thing because we need good friends. But don't allow those good friendships to keep you from receiving one another in Christ. When you come to a gathering like this or an event of the church and you're tempted to look down your nose at somebody, confess it. Confess it to Christ and then work hard to love them and receive them. I think C.S. Lewis's words along these lines are helpful. In Mere Christianity, he talks about not worrying about whether or not you truly love somebody, but just start acting like you love them, and eventually your emotions will catch up. And that's much of what church life together is. It's acting like you love one another, not because you're hypocrites, though we are, but to cultivate a genuine and deep and sincere love for one another made possible in Christ by the Spirit. Second, participate in the supper with an awareness of others. So when you know that the Lord's table will be celebrated, and it will be celebrated here next Sunday, reflect and examine and prepare in advance before you even get here. But as you're here, as you're singing, as there's a prayer of confession, truly confess your sin. Confess the fact that you were arguing with your spouse as you had trouble getting your kid in the car seat on the way over. Confess the fact that you have not thought about Christ even once this week. Confess the fact that you would rather just do whatever you want to do rather than what Christ wants you to do. Repent and then come to the table knowing that you're coming not alone but with a community of the redeemed who are just like you who are sinners, who are in need of Christ. Practically, as you do this, on Sunday morning as you come in and you see the customary three to five seats between you and the next person, slide in. Sit shoulder to shoulder so that as you partake of the one bread, symbolized in the one oyster cracker from the one bag, and the one cup in your thimble that you drink together, slide in shoulder to shoulder as one in Christ and partake of the table together. Jason told me of a tradition your church has of joining together hand in hand and singing the doxology after you partake in the Lord's table. I think that's really commendable, and I think that is a really good response to what Paul teaches about taking the Lord's Supper with a right view of the body of Christ. So as you come, work hard to remember that you're made new in Christ and you're made part of a new covenant community where you receive Christ together, where life is not about you, but about Christ and the work he has done on your behalf. It's not just about me and Jesus, it's about us and Christ. So let's reflect on that reality and go before the Lord and ask that he would work this in us by his spirit.